Okay, so now we'll go into that was an intro to getting your intuitions going here. Let's get into a little bit of details. So the logic. So at this point now there should be no surprise. We can so we have this thing called alpha, and alpha is a parameter, and we'll talk more about that in a bit. But the idea is that hey, if you have an atom that's assigned alpha one or a form that's assigned alpha one, that means you're considering it to be true. And for evaluating error, that's really key because all my things that have alpha comma one, I want those to be as close to the ground truth as possible. Likewise, if the lower is between, um, well, actually, sorry, upper bound, yeah, alpha and one for true. Now, likewise, for the lower bound, if it's between zero and Okay, so yeah, so for a positive atom, alpha and one is true. And for the false version, zero and one minus alpha. And then likewise, you could flip those around. What we'll get into though is in a little bit, there actually also we can have a space in between true and false where things are uncertain. And we'll talk about that analysis a little bit more. But this is looking at when you just have a straight single threshold here, so your intuition. So if something is in that unknown category, then um, yeah, I guess so. Like if a formula was in that unknown category, then like when you're doing that upward pass, right? Is it does it go like downward passes atom to formula, and upper is formula to atom? I'm just saying, like, if the formula is unknown, then what can you assume about like the atoms? And, like they're all unknown. So it can still contribute to it depending on on what that is. So um, depending on what that bound is, uh, one way to think about it is that the bounds on everything that's outside of your query is essentially being used by the forward and backward pass to reduce the bounds on your query. And the weights that end up getting learned are going to be all focused essentially on getting those bounds to collapse for the query you care about, because that's what was used in the training data to determine the weights. So this is where it talks about weights. Uh, the real value logic is also weighted, but this is kind of the key thing. Unlike other frameworks, we have this idea of things can be decomposed. So if I have A and B, that gets a weight, but then below it in the syntax tree, I have a weight for A and a weight for B. And that's what they mean by decomposability. And A and B are formulas. So what's kind of neat about this is one thing you could think of what they're doing here, if you look at things like rule learning and inductive logic programming, like none of that stuff is designed to fit the data like a machine learning model. In fact, they use totally different metrics uh, in evaluating and stuff like that. So what they're getting at here is they are fitting the data by adjusting the definitions of the fuzzy operators is essentially the way they look to get that extra model. Fit. And so So we have fuzzy operators and notice that we surround them with a function f. So the function f is simply going to be an activation because we want to you know, have this behave in a normal neural network kind of way. Um, but within it, we have, uh, you know, these are actually quite typical fuzzy operator definitions as to how things are combined. 
in terms of um, uh, the inputs. Now, of course, they're going to extend this where it's going to adjust both, use these operators to adjust both the upper and lower bounds of the weights, or of the, I'm sorry, of the uh, values. Now, this is where we get to the syntax tree. And what we have here is you see some logical formulas and they get broken down in the syntax tree. This is your neural structure. So this is what they're using to do uh, back propagation. Every, uh, yeah. Do you have a way to associate it with each of these operations? Yes. That's the black extent. Yeah. Or more precisely, weights associated with the incoming edges for each operator. So notice you have a bunch of WIs for all the inputs into that disjunction. And then you see the same thing here. So the weight for this edge and this edge are associated with this particular disjunction. And that's the thing, as this breaks apart, the subformulas, those weights are what are used in the layer above it. All right, so here's some examples of the activation functions used. And so they actually say that, hey, you know, there, you have this alpha setting, you have um, the activation function, these are parameters, and they talk about how there's a lot of different options. But then later in the paper, they talk about the tailored activation function. And uh, we'll talk about why that in particular is important. It has a lot to do with, um, you know, the optimization procedure, and, and we'll touch on that in a moment. Okay, but first we'll talk about inference, which is the forward pass, and also, you know, this is what you get as a result of learning. So if you have a new formula, you know, you can use this on that, although there's no guarantee how well it will the data. All right, so a little review. If you remember, we talked about the fixed point operator we had last time, where you had this sub, you had this thing here where it says, "Hey, add atoms that are in the head if the body is entailed uh, by the world." Well, that is also the same as having this thing called the proof rule, which says that, "Hey, given x, formula x then y, I conclude y." All right. So you can think of proof rules as kind of like an alternative way to express, you know, what we talked about last time with the fixed point. <laughs> you see fixed points more common in things like logic programming, proof rules. Actually, you tend to see those more in verification, um, but sometimes they come up in logic and they get called axioms. And so here's kind of the basic strategy. So they, based on their logic, they just define a set of correct proof rules for the logic. Now, one thing that's sort of nice about this is that if you somehow develop new logical syntax, some new kind of operator, uh, as long as you develop the proof rules associated with that, you could in theory extend their algorithms and still get the correct inference. Define how the bounds change based on atoms and negations are concluded from the proof rules. And then they, uh, they prove in the paper a minimum set of proof rules. Uh, based on the direction of inference. So they have one set for the forward, one set for I mean, upward, one set for the downward. Um, and they put it all together in an algorithm that's proven to be correct. So here are the basic proof rules that they have, and they show them in the paper in you know, classical logic. And then they say, well, hey, you know, this is, if this were classical, this would be all you need. Um, however, it's not, so we need to think about these upper and lower bounds of the weights. So they, you know, show this uh, basic, you know, on negation, for example, if the lower is greater than the uh, negation of the upper, then you get the signs of one minus uh, the upper. And so what they show in the base paper, they only show this with couple of the proof rules in the appendix, they actually list out the entire algorithm, which 
um, enumerates all the different operations taken for each proof rule, upper and lower bounds. But basically what you have going on here is um, in the upward pass, uh, uh, some formula, look at each op operand of the formula, and then you execute upward pass on there. That's essentially decomposing that formula. And then based on the operator, you see if Z equals negative X, then you're doing aggregation, but notice how you're just flipping those bounds around. This aggregation is aggregating all those bounds together for each atom. And then if it's something else, uh, they show it for this particular operator here, you're gonna aggregate based on those definitions, which is what I showed two slides ago. Same kind of setup going for the other pass, except it's essentially going the other way. And so that's the intuition behind it. Go ahead. So uh, if in the inference procedure, the decomposition of formulas is possible, why not do the decomp uh, decomposition of the neural networks as well? Because, you know, uh, as I said, the neural network is fixed according to a formula uh, and um, it's not possible to change after the training process. Well, yeah, but you see the neural network, going back to this, is based right on the syntax here. Yeah. So all that breaking apart done by the forward pass algorithm is essentially going through that. Okay. But with the waste being fixed. 